My name is Christine Command. I am the founder and president of Chasing Horses Wild Horse Advocates, and we advocate for the wild horses here in North Dakota. As you know, on December 12, 2022, the park announced their plans to eliminate the entire herd of horses from the park. So we've been kind of leading the fight to um, raise awareness and keep them in the park. And these horse talks are a big way that we do that. So we appreciate everyone being here. We hope this is a way to help educate people and just share information. So um, today we're gonna talk to Heather and Linda from Save Our Wild Horses. They're the two ladies behind the second annual Save Our Wild Horses Conference in Washington, DC this month. They're gonna give a presentation and then they'll be here to answer your questions afterwards. So if you have any questions for them or if you have questions for us, just please um, put them in the chat. We have everybody muted and we're hoping that it stays that way. We had 55 people signed up for this. Um, so we just don't want everyone talking or sometimes people forget that they unmuted themselves. So just out of respect for them. So thank you guys for being here and thank you, Linda and Heather. And I will turn it all over to you now. Thank you, Chris. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. All right, so um, yes, thank you everybody for coming today. Today is Sunday, April 2nd. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the conference and some other things going on with wild horses. And then Chris is gonna talk to you a little bit more about the Theodore Roosevelt National Horses, National Park Horses. So first of all, we really do wanna thank Chris for working with us to put this event on today. Um, she's definitely the one hosting the event. She contacted us and asked us if we would like to join and we said, absolutely. Um, I think we, both of our organizations feel that um, collaboration and unity is so important and that is what's going to help save our wild horses in the long run. Um, and then like Chris said, if you do have any questions about the TRNP horses or the conference or anything in regards to wild horses or burrows, go ahead and put that in the chat box and we will all cover your questions at the end. So we're gonna start off today by talking about the conference that is being held in Washington DC again this year. Um, my motto for this year is wild horses need our voices. And we really do hope to see you in Washington DC this year. We're gonna start off our five day event with the Wild Horse Rally on the National Mall in Washington, DC. And that is going to be on Saturday, April 22nd from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. That is also Earth Day. So we do expect the National Mall to be very busy. We're going to have a pop-up tent that will have Save Our Wild Horses banners on it. We'll have wild horse photography, informational displays. We're gonna have plenty of posters and banners available for you to help carry around. Um, as well as our trifold brochures and other information that you can hand out to people to help spread the word about our plight, the plight of America's wild horses and burrows today. So many people don't know about it, and the point of the rally is to help spread that word. We're also going to have a coloring table for kids where they can color postcards, um, and then we'll put a stamp on it and mail it to their legislator for them. We're working on some overhead horse puppets. Uh, the hope is to have, I think, five or six of them, and we'll need some help carrying those around. We have a um, person bringing some drums to help gather some attention, and then a banner to carry in front of those that says, Save Our Wild Horses. So we'll need a couple people to help carry the banner, five or six people to help carry the overhead puppets. Um, Linda, why don't you talk about the location for a second? Okay. Um Last October, I went in and put, a, put, a, put in for the permit for this. Um, National Park Services is very um, understaffed and I've been following up. We still don't know how, do not have our location. I asked for between 14th and 17th Street and I've had two responses back from them, but I still don't, do not have the location. As soon as we have that, we will be posting it everywhere but please do check the website the day before because last year they did move it the day before the event. We have no control over this. And, but again, we're gonna have the, the easy up's gonna be blue where you're gonna be able to see the puppets. You'll be able to find us walking and the mall's beautiful to walk. So if you have to walk a little ways, just enjoy it. And you know, don't think that you have to be there exactly on time. It's gonna be, you know, three or four hours that we're gonna be there. And um, it should be really a fun time. And oh, what, what carrying the signs around, even if you just go wandering, is a really great opportunity to talk to other people and possibly send them back to the booth. So I think it should be really fun. 
All right. And then um, the conference itself is going to be held from April 23rd to April 25th. We're holding it at the same location as last year, which is Yotel DC. Um, it's a beautiful hotel. It's definitely unique. Um, their theme is purple and white. Um, we have conference tickets available now on our Eventbrite link, um, which is available on the website. I will also be throwing all these links in the chat box as soon as I'm done with the presentation. So get ready for an onslaught of links in the chat box at the end. Um, the conference ticket price is $200. That does cover all three days of the conference itself, as well as a couple of lunches. Um, I have a list of our speakers there that are going to be talking this year. We're also going to be adding a couple more to that list um, before we get there to DC. We also have a new event that we're excited to announce on Sunday afternoon, April 23rd, and it's going to be an afternoon of rewilding with the Canna Foundation. And the founder of Canna, Amanda, will be there, as well as Dr. Ross McPhee will be joining us remotely. We have a presentation from Wouter Helmer, who will be talking about rewilding in Europe and what a success it has been. Um, we have Elise Vaughn and Samantha Scanendor joining us as well. They are going to be sponsoring the lunch that day as well as doing their presentation. We also have three U.S. representatives lined up to visit uh, the conference so far, and we're hoping to announce more names um, as we go. And then also included as part of your conference ticket on Monday night, April 24th at 7 p.m., we're going to be doing a, an exclusive screening of Wild Beauty Mustang Spirit of the West. And you all are welcome to join us for that as well. So I wanted to touch base a little bit more on the afternoon of rewilding with Canna Foundation. If you are attending the Save Our Wild Horse conference for two to three days and you purchase your conference ticket for $200, you are automatically included in this special event. If you're unable to attend the conference for all three days and you simply want to join us on Sunday afternoon from 12 to 4 for the afternoon of rewilding with Canna Foundation, we have a separate conference ticket available for just $75 and that will include lunch that day as well. Um, I have the link to that. The Eventbrite page is up and I will throw the, the link for that event in the chat box as soon as I'm finished with the presentation. Linda, did you want to talk about that at all for a second? Yeah, I was just going to say that, yeah, if you are connected with any other wildlife organization and climate change organizations, rewilding while we're a keystone to that is the horse, it is about saving the public lands and not even just public lands, lands across the country. It's part of the 3030 plan. So if you know somebody that from the Sierra Club or any other organization that might find it valuable or might want to make connections with some of these people that are experts with rewilding, it could be a great opportunity. I've reached out to several different groups right here in DC, but please think, keep in mind and invite people to these events because like the rally is free, the lobby day is free. We just have overhead for the conference, so we just have to cover that. But like I said, just please share it out and just think kind of outside the box if there's you know, if you can think of anybody that might benefit from this or be able to contribute to it. All right, so after the three full conference days, then we're going to have Wild Horse Lobby Day, and this will be on Wednesday, April 26. So there's a few different ways that you can participate in Lobby Day. Um, first of all, if you're coming to DC, please join us in person. We're arranging to have a meeting room located somewhere on Capitol Hill that we can meet at on Wednesday morning at around nine o'clock. And the goal is to hand out as many congressional packets that Linda and I are making up, printing out, and wild horse calendars as we can to members of Congress. And there are six buildings to cover if we plan to do both the representatives and the Senate, although most of our focus is going to be on the representatives. So we have the Rayburn House, the Cannon House, and the Longworth House. Those of you who have been mailing letters to your representatives or sending postcards will recognize those house buildings because those are part of the addresses that you mail those postcards and letters to. Um, if you can't join us in DC, the next best thing you can do is call your rep and your senator's offices now and request an in-person at home in your state meeting or a remote meeting for either Wednesday, April 26th or any time that week, really. We just want to make a big presence for that entire week of April 23rd. We do have some tips on how to make that uh, appointment with your representatives at saveourwildhorses.net. And I'm going to show you a quick screenshot of that page as well with the tips on it. When I get to that, Linda, I'll let you talk there for a second because you're more of okay. a lobbying person than I am. Okay. Um, before we get to that, I just want to talk quickly about the Public Lands Council. 
Um, a lot of people think that the Public Lands Council, well, that's a positive name. They must really like our public lands. No, no, that's a group of ranchers. Um, and after holding their conference virtually for the last two years, they've decided to do it in person this year, and they are doing it at the exact same time that we're doing ours. So they are going to be in person in Washington, D.C. on April 24th and April 25th. This is a screenshot from their website, um, and it just goes to show you, you know, that they're also well organized with their conference and putting things together. Um, I love their little blip down there at the bottom that says, but wait, there's more. We encourage all PLC members to take advantage of this wonderful opportunity. Um, so this is, I just went to publiclandscouncil.org, clicked on events and clicked on 2023 conference to see this information. And thank you to Sandy Sharkey for pointing it out to us about a month ago that they were in fact holding this at the same time as we are. I took a screenshot of their um, itinerary and I highlighted in red some of the key points that I want you guys to look at to tell you just how important it is to either come to DC or if you're not going to come to DC to participate in lobbying with your representative that week because that's what the Public Lands Council is going to DC to do is to lobby with congressional representatives. So I highlighted in red um, you can see from 8.30 to 9, they're inviting congressional representatives, which could be the reps themselves or their staffers, to join them for coffee and a conversation. And then from 9 to 10.30, they're going to talk about key administrative actions that affect, affect federal lands grazing. From 1.15 to 2.30, they're going to hear from key leaders from the House and Senate Natural Resources Committee and Western members of Congress on their priorities in the 118th con congressional session. So what that means is they're going to be telling our representatives and our senators just how important it is to continue to allow cattle grazing on Western public lands. It's our job to be there and combat that with a different message. 2.30 to 3 o'clock, they're going to have a targeted briefing on the most pressing legislative issues for meetings with agency staff. Um, and then 3 to 4.30, again, they're going to talk with key leadership from House and Senate agriculture committees. And then on Tuesday and Wednesday, the 25th and 26th, they have agency and Hill meetings all day, which means they will be on the Hill on the 26th the same time that we will. So again, we need to make a very big presence on the Hill on Wednesday. If you're able to join us in person that day and help us hand out those packets and those calendars and talk to staffers and reps, please, please, please do, because we have to combat what the Public Lands Council is doing. And not to mention, this is the second time that they've been on the Hill already this year. Okay, so wild horses need your voices. There's any number of ways that you can make your voice heard. Um, Hang on, for start just a second, Heather. I wanted to talk a little bit about the lobby thing real quick. <laughs> you guys, if you're gonna call, acknowledge that you know Public Lands Council has been in there and sit there and say, you need to understand that there are special interests. We are trying to come, we are the public, we are your constituents, and we have a different voice and we want science to be looked at. You can actually turn it around. If you don't acknowledge it, Sometimes they say, okay, well, I don't know who to believe, but you could sit there and say, I know what they told you, but we would like you to look at the science that we're giving you. So it's really important to, to know that they're doing that. And they didn't announce the dates until after we had the conference established and they were they came in because they they've already been in DC, but they're coming back probably directly related to us. And we do need to have more numbers than they do. We need to be there because they show up in mass. So uh, anyway, I just wanted to acknowledge that. And that uh, April 26th is Nat help, help a Horse Day, National Health Help a Horse Day. So we need to be helping the horses. But don't be intimidated either. And like I said, we're there for you if you need any advice or help. And if you're on the Hill, we're going to have people that will go with you. We have a lot of experienced people that are going to be there that can go with you. So, okay, there you go, Heather. I'm sorry. Yeah, we're not just going to hand you a stack of packets and tell you to go around. <laughs> Somebody experienced will be with your group. So, um, yeah, certainly we'll be there to help you. Um, okay. And uh, I do have another slide on the lobbying that I'll let you go over to, Linda, here in just a minute. Right. Um, so, yeah, again, there's a number of ways that you can make your voice heard regarding wild horses. Um, you can participate in our new 2023 Wild Horse Postcard Campaign. Um, and we're going to ask you to send postcards to your U.S. representative, both of your senators and the White House. And I've gone ahead and included Secretary Holland again. And so I put underneath of there, yes, send a postcard to Secretary Holland and the White House. It can't hurt, it can only help. 
And what encouraged me to go ahead and include her again was something that uh, the National Wildlife Federation said in their webinar last week, which was make your voice heard, send the letters in. It's okay if you don't hear back from them, but they're not gonna see a letter or see a postcard if you don't send it to them. If you don't send them something to tell them that wild horses are important to you, then they don't know. So yeah, if you could do five postcards, that's one, two, three, four, five, which is how many I have in the postcard pack, and then that would be one to each of those people. It, you know, all it can do is help. It certainly cannot hurt. Um, you can also just send a letter via the mail and then take that same letter and copy and paste it onto the contact screen on your representative or senator's uh, websites or the White House webpage. There's a contact screen for every one of those people. And you can just plop your letter in there and send it that way as well. After that, follow up with a phone call a week later. And, you know, start with, hi, I'm calling to make sure that so-and-so got my postcard and letters. And then you want to pick two or three talking points to talk to them about. Request a meeting where you can talk with either the representative themselves or with the staffer or aide who handles um, what public lands committees, natural resource committees, budget committees, things like that. Okay, so for lobbying on the SaverWildHorses.net website, right up there at the top is the tab for lobbying 101 steps. Can't miss it. Linda, you wanna go over this for a minute? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on my phone, so I can't go item by item. But yeah, it, this is a really easy step-by-step -step thing. It actually gives you sample scripts, the phone numbers to call. And for the lobbying we're gonna be doing on the 26th, call your, your representative's office in DC because they're the ones that help that deal with um, a lot of the stuff. The local offices deal with more with personal things and stuff like that. So you do want to call the DC number for this stuff. And, um, and let's see. And, I, and then, like I said, there is a script and there, there is important to follow up. A lot of them have a portal where you go and you'll do it online. You'll request, you'll request an appointment. Wait a few, two or three days. If you don't get a response, call them. Say, I submitted it. I didn't get anything back. If you leave a message, leave a message and then call them back. Eventually, when a staff and a staffer picks up, these are young people. Usually, they're a lot of times they're interns. Be polite. Just tell them that you know they're not the ones that ignored your email, and just ask them if you you could talk to their aide that deals with public lands and try to get a hold of that person. And if you don't get them, write their name down. So start gathering information and briefly talk about why you're calling. And sometimes you get these people in the office where they really love the horses. So start working with them a little bit, trying to build a foundation for a relationship. So when you have we have new stuff come forward, like all of a sudden we get a bill or we get this or that. You can call them up and say, hey, you know, this is about Linda Greaves from DC. I was uh, talking to you about that about a month ago. And they say, oh yeah. I said, well, we have some legislation that's gonna be coming through. Can you please ask them to pay attention to it? So it's a matter of creating these relationships. Um, I'm sorry. And so, yeah, so I think that's a really important to do, but then to follow up. And then if you're going to get, when we, the whole purpose of the conference is to give you a foundation. So when you go in there, you're confident, you understand what you're doing, you'll understand everything in this staffer packet. And we don't have our personal agendas. We have a, a general public's opinion of what we want to bring forward of Save Our Whole for Horses. We're not promoting any one person's plan or anything. We want science-based education and that the public lands are our lands. So that's kind of the foundation of what we're building on is to give you the science of why this might be the way to go, or this might be the way to go. And we'll have three or four talking points and you could pick the ones that talk, resonate with you. So we're not telling you exactly what to do. We're trying to give you the tools to become a better advocate. So, okay. So a little bit of information on the postcard campaign. Um, if you haven't sent your postcards yet, please do so. The goal is to have the postcards on their desks at their DC addresses by the time we arrive in DC. However, if you don't have time to do it in the next couple of weeks and you do it in May, that's fine too. Um, and there's nothing better than a postcard, right? It has pictures of our wild horses. It has a message on the front and you can handwrite your message on the back. We have um, a wild horse advocate, Pam, who attended one of uh, Wild Beauty's screenings last weekend and she took postcards with her to hand out to people attending the screening and she included uh, instructions on how to fill out the postcard. She handed those out so those people could mail in. I have a couple of people, including Victoria, who are working with teachers and schools to have uh, kids in classrooms send in postcards. Yeah, that's great because that's, you know, 20, 30 postcards at a time going in. 
Um, good messages for the kids to write would be, be a hero, save our wild horses. And then a good message for you to write as an adult um, is that we request you freeze funding to the Bureau of Land Management until an investigation into why the BLM is wasting our taxpayer dollars on roundups and refuses to do proper on-range management plans can be looked into. And, you know, freezing funding and taxpayer dollars, those are two phrases that really will get representatives ears up. You know, that's something that they will, oh, I mean, it just really grabs their attention. Um, so yeah, again, talk to other organizations about doing their own postcard campaigns. If you're involved in an organization or know somebody who is, reach out to them um, and just see if they'd be willing to do their own. They can create their own postcards and provide them to you guys. Um, Chris, actually, um, who's doing the call with us today, she created some for the TRNP horses, and she was willing to even mail them out to you guys so that you could send them in. So I'll let her talk about that a little bit later. Um, kids, classrooms, schools, 4-H groups, postcards, or even just a letter writing campaign, if that's easier. Uh, we have uh, Cynthia in Florida. She ordered quite a few. And if I'm not mistaken, she's actually going to have a girls' night. And then they're all going to get together and fill out the postcards together. And then she's going to put stamps on them and mail them. So there's any number of ways that you could get people involved. Okay, so one of the reasons it is important to send in information or contact your representatives about wild horses is this reply that I got from Representative Rick Larson from Washington. Um, I sent him a letter uh, that was written by, I think, Wild Horse Education. I sent it to him, and this was the reply that I got back. Um, Thank you for contacting me about the humane treatment of horses and burrows. I highlighted and read the parts that I want you guys to actually look at, because note that he says that while he recognizes and appreciates the unique role horses play in the life of, lives of his constituents, he continues to support the BLM in successfully administering the BLM's wild horse and burrow program. That is unacceptable. He goes on to give a positive point, which is that he's a co-sponsor of the Soaring Act. That's nice, that's good, we support that. However, he goes on to say that he does not support the SAFE Act because he has met with many small farmers in the second district in Washington who have told him how expensive it is to care for non-working horses on their farms. He wants the SAFE Act amended to address those concerns and then he would consider looking at it. So a couple of things there. Um, first of all, the SAFE Act has not been reintroduced for this session. So talking about the SAFE Act to your representatives at this particular time is not key because there's no legislation to actually talk about. But when the SAFE Act is introduced, if you're in his district, um, we're gonna bombard him with letters about reasons why he should support the SAFE Act. But in the meantime, we need to bombard him with postcards and letters and phone calls about how the BLM's current wild horse and burrow program is failing, not only the wild horses and burrows, but our public lands, our wildlife, and we're just not going to accept it. So he's on our list of people who is for sure going to receive a congressional packet when we're on the Hill. Okay, Linda, um, I put your notes down that you wanted to talk about the YouTube channel. Oh, yes. Um, I, for everybody coming, um, like I said, each year that we do this, we're trying to move it forward. We're not going to be repeating the same thing stuff over and over again. There's definitely reoccurring themes, of course. But please go to the Saver Wild Horses YouTube channel, and you can see the presenters from last year. And um, please watch those videos, get up to date. And even if you can't come, uh, the speakers we had last year were just top notch. They were amazing people, and they it really changed a lot of our views on different things. We're all, I think even the other speakers learn from the other speakers. So it's a really great opportunity to do that. And, um, and then the other thing I wanted to talk about was that fact that this event is open to everybody. We've heard some stuff about not, not inviting everybody. We invited speakers based on subject matter, not what organization they're with. And the, the everybody is invited. And this year, we specifically spent a lot of time sending emails out to every organization we could think of. We even asked some people, I know I asked Ginger Fedek to, to you know, reach out to a couple of organizations and some other people. So, but if you, everybody's welcome to come. We're not keeping anybody out. We want everybody to attend. We want everybody to share it. It's gonna take us all putting our differences aside again to make this happen. And um, 
And then I think that was and the questions main... for questions at the conference. Yeah, if, if you have any questions about it stuff going on at the conference and stuff like I've had a couple people ask me how, how to get from Union Station. So I went in and I did a video and I put it on the DC uh, Save Our Wild Horses DC Facebook group. If you have any questions, reach out to me. I think Heather's going to throw my email in there and I could about logistics and stuff like that and or just, you know, what you need to bring or anything. And I will say the one thing, if you're coming for the whole conference, of the, the, just the lobby day, bring comfortable shoes. I know it's, you, you're going to get dressed a little bit nicer going on hill. If you don't want to wear high heels, there's a lot of walking. Yeah, and, and about dressing nicer, you know, maybe a little nicer than you normally would, because I can guarantee you the Public Lands Council are probably going to be in suits um, or shirts yeah. and ties or something. So we want to make a strong presence as well um, and look like we're calm and professional and mature. So if you have a little bit nicer of an outfit to bring for Lobby Day, that'd be great. Okay, so I wanted to um, just throw this beautiful photo of the McCulloch Peaks horses up here and just say that every action that you take does matter and does count. Um, representatives, senators, Secretary Hall in the White House, if you send something to them, you know, obviously Biden might not see it himself, but his staffers are going to. And if his staffers start receiving 10, 20, 100 postcards or letters a week, it is something that they are then required to bring up with him. So it does make a difference, even if you don't get a response. Um, and I'll say, I sent uh, a letter, three-page letter, and a matted photograph to both President Biden and Jill Biden um, almost two years ago now. And it took a year to get a response, but I did get a response from them. And that's the important thing is, you know, a year, six months, a month, it doesn't matter. Send it to them. They're going to see it. And that's what's going to make a difference. If we don't send them information, if we don't contact them, then the only people they're hearing from you guys is the ranchers and the people who do want to continue grazing their cattle and their sheep out on the range. And our horses will continue to lose. It's up to us to save our horses. And then I included a few photos here from last year um, from DC. So uh, just as an example, one of our that might be Ginger FedEx sitting at the table. I can't quite tell from the back, Ginger, if that's you or not. But um, one of our attendees had an appointment, a remote appointment with a representative and Eric Molbar and a few of our other attendees. I think I definitely recognize Terry sitting there. And I think that's Mindy Plus yeah. um, on the meeting so that it looked like there were several constituents sitting in on the meeting, which there were. Um, representative Cohen came and spoke with us in person uh, during one of our lunches. Scott Beckstead is there sharing the graphic that um, Vickery Eckhoff had put together um, about grazing on public lands. Um, down in the bottom left-hand corner, Wild Beauty Foundation Ambassador Jocelyn joined us. Um, so inspiring to have somebody so young who is getting involved in wild horse advocacy. Um, and then we have a picture there of our room, uh, which is the room we will have again this year. Um, those flyers in the back were the I Support Wild Horse flyers that several of you signed up for. Okay, I'm going to stop screen sharing for a second, and then I'll come back to it, but I am going to draw the winner for the raffle on that beautiful 41 inch by 21 inch limited edition metal print that was taken by Valerie Henry. Her photography page is Koru Photo Designs, and the photo is of two beautiful stallions from my heart herd in McCulloch Peaks in Wyoming. So I have all of the names of everybody and they're folded in half. My husband cut them up for me this morning and folded them in half for me. So I don't know what's where. So I'm gonna pull one out and show you guys the winner of who's gonna win that print. And it's Peggy Coleman Taylor. Yay. <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> Peggy. We will work on getting that print out to you next week. Okay, let me screen share for one more second. Okay, so Chris Kaman with uh, Chasing Horses Wild Horse Advocates, who is um, doing this webinar with us today, she did a blog post today that I think it's important for everybody to read. And she started it with a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., which is, our lives begin to end the day we become, become silent about the things that matter. Um, and she included in that blog post, this is an extremely critical time for these horses and it is not the time to be silent. Our 
Sorry, my thing's blocking it. On our horse talk last week with Dr. Castle McLaughlin, we talked about the fact that if the horses are removed, they will never bring them back. And that is happening not only with national parks. Um, Mesa Verde National Park removed the horses just last year or the year before. They'll never bring them back. And then most of you know my numbers of 329 wild horse herds when the BLM started managing them were down to 165 today. Those remaining ones will never come back. So it is time for us to make our voices heard before we keep losing more and more of them. Chris? Thank you guys again for that. It was, it was a, a wonderful presentation. Um, I do know that we did get an email in and I thought that this was a really good question, especially in light of our world today. Someone wanted to know um, for the congressional day, what are people allowed to carry into buildings, cameras, cell phones, probably good, right? What about a tablet or iPad? What is the screening procedure these days? So is there a link of do's or don'ts for entry into the hallowed halls of the Capitol? Okay, I thought that was I, a good, really good yeah. question. That is a good question because that's one of the reasons we were going to, we were talking about doing a staff for luncheon, but then they, I called and I was told that the, the, they are open. You can carry basic business of things. You, you're not going to be able to carry a sign in there that per se, that would have a stick and stuff like that. But I would only bring your essentials, um, no types of weapons of any kind, pocket knives and stuff like that. You would not be able to have, but as of, as of right now, and like I said, if, it, if things change, if the halls are open and that's, they said that we can actually go and pop in on offices where we don't even have appointments. So that's that's kind of what we're planning on doing. But again, anybody coming, we are gonna be responsible, professional, if, no yelling at people. We don't want any crying or yelling. And that has been done in the halls of Congress by horse advocates. We don't wanna do that. We wanna come across as professional as the, the, uh, as the other side, if not more so. Um, but like I said, you know, so just keep it aware, just bring what you need. Like if you have a laptop, I've taken my iPad in because I usually do have video saved on it. And if I have somebody that's, you know, compassionate stuff, I don't show it. If not, then I will show it. Um, but I don't think there'll be a problem with that, but they're not gonna let you take a big jump, duffel bag full of stuff in just, you know, like a briefcase or something like that. Okay. Um, someone asked, are there activities planned for April 25th? Well, that's going to be a full day of conference, you know, conference on the, and that, and then so, we don't really have anything because some people don't get to DC very often and they wanted to have some downtime. So they want to be able to get out and go somewhere where it's not like having to do that. So after the, the conference is going from nine until five and then people mix and mingle a little bit after that. But some people want to be able to go out and go to a certain restaurant and go on the, and it, it'll be light still. So they actually want to get on the mall because the hotel is walking distance, five minutes walk to the Capitol and you can go down the mall and there's all the memorials and stuff. So there, there's plenty to do in DC. Okay. Um, someone said, be clear, PLC equals NCBA. I don't know if you want to talk about that. Well, Public Lands Council is a branch, branch or say, I'm not sure what they're asking exactly. Okay. I mean, I don't know I, what the NBCA is. Yeah, me either. And CBA. So maybe. Penny, if you have that information, what the NCBA is. Um, can we get a checklist for lobbying? They, you have that on your website. I think you talked about that. Um, yeah. But basically what we're doing is, um, and one thing that the first uh, comment on here was from Penny, and she says, last year we were prepared so well for our meetings with our reps. It was a huge help and we were able to hand them a packet of well-organized facts. If not attending in person, that is available to you too. So Tuesday, Afternoon is our lobby day um, where we have Marty coming to tell us how to lobby. And then we have um, Cynthia coming to talk about um, how to present yourself, but also talk about media. Um, so we're going to have uh, Wild Horse Congressional packets all made up and ready to give to you to give to your representative. If you are not attending the conference and you're doing this remotely, that information will be available as a PDF download on the website where you can download it, print it yourself, and either take it to your in-person meeting or mail it to them. Okay, can I, add, can I add on to that real quick? If you're gonna do it virtually, I would suggest you download it and you, you send it to them the morning or the day before your meeting. And then when you call them, just say, can you please pull that up so you can go through the paperwork 
as you're going through it. So, and then you, if you do it virtually, always follow up with a phone call afterwards to just say thank you again. And if there, you have a question, there's a question you don't know the answer to, all you do is say, I don't know, I will get you that answer. And that gives you a reason to call them back. I was gonna say too, if you guys wanted to, um, we can create a call to action on this through our website, just for people to contact their representatives. Um, if you wanna have some key talking points we can put together and then it's just a blast email that'll send automatically to their representatives. Um, we can do that. And then they can also, it can also be customized where if they wanna have a meeting or schedule meeting, they can add that in there too and say, you know, I would like an opportunity to talk to you on this day or this week. Um, I also wanted to tell you too, I did find out because one of our state representatives offered to help us get meetings with our federal legislators. So that's another thing too, that if you're gonna be there or if you're just trying to get in touch with somebody for a virtual or in person, if you're having a hard time, contact your state reps and they can also help too with that. That's good, that's good advice. Um, NCBA is National Cattlemen and Beef Association. Yeah, so basically they're probably sister organizations. Yeah. And then Senator Tester from Montana feels the same way as Mr. Larson. Yeah, they definitely have their supporters. That's why we're, at, we're in the position we're in right now, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and make a list, you guys. Like, if you know that there's a particular representative, I mean, I know Amy, Amy Klobuchar, she's a senator. I know she's anti-wild horse, too. So, um, you know, we're not, our focus isn't wholly on senators right now because there's no legislation in front of them. And it's it's the representatives, the House of Representatives, who actually passes the budget and gives the BLM their money. So they, they're they really our focus. But if you do know of any in particular, such as Rep. Larson, who is anti-wild horse, we want to put him on the list so that we give him that packet and take a few minutes to talk to either him or his staffer as we're wandering around the halls of those three buildings. So send that, you know, send those names to me or send them to Linda. Um, I'll put both of our email addresses in the chat box as well as those links. I'll start getting those links in there too. Um, and then someone asked, why are specific Congress persons on the list for a packet more so than others? I think you kind of just answered that a little bit. Yeah, bas yeah, basically there's some people that are really good and they're, they're open to the information. And then there's people that, you know, if we, we, we want to at least let them know that we're watching them. So there's there's two reasons. They're either really supportive and we want them to have the most current information because what they're dealing with, with public lands cancel, they're getting stuff told to them that is what people thought 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago instead of what's most current that we've learned through like, you know, the environment changing and stuff like that. So, you know. Well, I also stuff. think, I think one thing that I learned very, during this process we've been in with our state is that I think sometimes we assume that they know everything and they don't. <laughs> yeah. um, there were questions that they asked during our testimony where really they were depending on us to educate them. So, yeah. and I think it's the same with this too. There are so many different issues you can imagine that our lawmakers are, are have in front of them that they don't know if we don't tell them like you guys are saying, so. Yeah, and a, a big point on that too is the new, especially new Congress people come in and they, they assume that the BLM is telling them the truth. And until they've been told that, and that's what I hear from people out in DC, well, I've never heard from anybody about the wild horses or the only people they've ever heard from are the public lands council people or the cattle industry. So the only thing message they've heard is that. So we wanna make sure that we're getting it out. And if we had enough people, we would hit every office, but it's just a matter of logistics and of physically being able to do it. And, you know, like making up these packages for, you know, hundreds of people is a lot of work, a lot of cost. And so, like I said, I've started already printing them out and I leave the printer running all overnight and stuff like that, making the different copies. So, yeah, so it's a big job. But yeah, so, and like I said, if somebody thinks there's somebody that's, you know, especially like if they're on the um, budget committee and stuff like that. So there's people on certain committees that we're going to target, people that we think might have sway in our direction and people that we want to know to know that, hey, we're keeping an eye on you. We know what you're doing. Um, Nikki asked, will people be assigned to visit different reps at different times? what will groups supporting the people lobbying be doing? So I guess like, will you have um, some kind of a, a navigation for people who are there to help pass out packets like, you know? Well, it, pretty much we're, we're hoping people will get as many appointments to, with their their legislators as possible. So if, and so if I'm gonna go, let's say I'm gonna go to the Cannon building, I'm gonna go down this hallway, 
I'm going to take a handful of those packets and, uh, you know, it's, and if somebody else is going down a different direction and the big thing is, and just take them and we'll stop in where we can. Um, but usually you can't get appointments if you're not a constituent. So we, we're going to, that, and that's why I asked my Congress person, person if that we could pop in and they said the halls are open and there's maybe some people that don't allow us in. You have to understand all these people also have the right to set rules per their office. So you may go to a door and they say, if you don't have a mask on or if you don't have an appointment, you can't come in. But the, the general rule right now is it is open. So we're going to try to hit as many as we can. And like I said, we are we do have a few people, you know, especially like the budget committees people. We really they need to know that we're looking at them and that this is ridiculous. And if they don't know that it's being mismanaged, maybe they will look at it. I think that's a good point, too. Do people need to bring masks? Um, we'll have masks. It's not required if somebody's comfortable with it, because if you're on the hill, sometimes it's, it is crowded and stuff. Um, and, you know, you know, and you're walking in different places. But right now it is not required anywhere in D.C. Um, but, you know, and, and if you have, there, any there health are, issues, I have seen some, some representatives on TV who are still wearing there. So if you have the ability of having <laughs> a mask with you and I do have a bag, I'll see if I can remember to bring it with me. Um, yeah, just put it in your purse or your bag or your pocket so that if they do want you to put it on, you can just put it on really quick. And Linda, I was just wondering um, if you do walk up to someone's door and they say, you know, you're not a constituent, I won't talk to you. Can we still hand them a packet? Yeah, I would just sit there and say, hi, I'm just, I'm meeting with my constituent over there. And I just noticed your door open. I just was, we're trying to, um, it's, you know, this is going to be, you know, you know, help a horse day. And we're just trying to share out this information that we're doing. We just had a conference in DC and we wanted to share the information that we're we, we've accumulated from experts. I think part of what this person maybe was asking, if I'm understanding this right, is if, um, so if I'm coming for lobby day, if I come and see you, will you give me some packets and say, hey, Chris, we need you to cover this hall? I think that that's what they're talking about. Like, so that I'm not going to the same place that you're going to passing out the same information. I think that that was kind of their question. Well, we'll kind of coordinate it because if somebody's going to go to the south side of the cannon building we'll probably be going to get together unless if they're at the same time then that's why we have the room at at uh we're hoping to i think it's going to be in the cannon building where we're going to meet and kind of get a lay of the land because unfortunately people will say they're coming and they don't come and other people may show up that we weren't expecting so we kind of need to be able to be fluid we need to have like a command center and if, we're, if somebody's going that way you know they can hit it and maybe that's a good thing do a joint text on everybody and just type in as, as you're going down, if you went to, you know, um, Senator Warner's office and this and that, just, just to put it in the group chat so everybody knows where, where they've already been hit. Okay. So that's actually a really good idea. Okay. <clears throat> I wanted to just say a couple of things. One was um, that you guys were talking about how people aren't going to know if you don't contact them, right? We don't know if, if President Biden will ever see your postcard or Secretary Holland, but if you don't send it, we know they're never going to see it. I know when all of this started in December with the Theodore Roosevelt National Park courses, when they came out with their press release, my husband and I kept sitting in front of the news going, okay, maybe they're going to talk about it today. Well, maybe they're going to talk about it today. And it was a couple of days and we were like, what is going on? We finally picked up the phone and started calling news stations and saying, do you realize that the park just announced they're getting rid of all the horses? And they were like, no, you're kidding me. So again, it speaks to that, where if you're not speaking out, then no, no one's going to know anything. Um, also, I wanted to say the quote that I had in my blog today came from a meeting I had with a new reporter on Friday. She contacted me because she American Wild Horse Campaign put up a bull, billboard in our town. And so she saw the billboard and she went to you know, she was searching for someone local that was doing something about the horses. And she said, I'm, I was really confused. When I look at all these other organization pages, it's been months since they posted anything. And then I found your page and American Wild Horse Campaign also referred her to us. And she said, but, um, so this is someone who would not have known who lives here in the town, 30 miles from the park that wouldn't have known without American Wild Horse Campaign's billboard being up. And this is why we make blogs every day. Um, and why I say every time on December 12th, you know, the park announced their plans because we constantly meet people who don't know. So really speaking up is really so important. And I just wanted to talk to that, like you guys were saying, so. Yeah. Um, 
don't know if I found anything else. Well, I, I wrote down some notes while you guys were talking. Um, but yeah, definitely lean on your, your state reps. They can help get meetings set up if you need that. Um, will media be allowed to the conference without a ticket? I'll be sending out a media yes. advisory. Okay. Good. All right. And as far as media, if anybody knows anybody in media, invite them. We want, we want to get the word out, just like you said. Because, I mean, I've been doing the mobile billboard um, in D.C., for about five years now. And I have had people, Congress people, when I'm talking to them, they ask, is that your billboard? And I would say, yes. And you know, now we've, we upgraded it last year with um, the saverwildhorses.net website. I had a different one before that, but Heather had this one going and she does a fantastic job. So if people were using that one and it, having it out, and I have a great contractor that is very, very reasonable. So if anybody else ever wants to have it running around, he's willing to, he's willing to do it. I mean, it's like I said, it's just information. And um, so the billboards do make a difference because people don't know. And I hear all the time, it's like, I didn't know there's wild horses out West anymore. Right. I mean, he was, we assume, we have to stop assuming that anybody knows anything. Correct. All right. Does anybody else have any questions? You guys have anything else that you want to add? <laughs> well, I would, I would like to say that there's several people on this call that have been so supportive and people sometimes call me or Heather and talk about like, we're a bit business. No, we're, 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 this is a grassroots. She was working under the Saver Wild Horses banner. I was doing stuff on the Saver Wild Horses two years ago and I invited her to get involved with the conference. She said, absolutely, yes. And it, so we each bring different things to the thing. We're just two people, just like what you've done where you're at, just anybody. It can be us that makes the difference and us who can bring people together. It doesn't have to be somebody with, millions of dollars or a big fancy name or anything else it can just it's ultimately it's going to be us because a lot of the big fancy people they do have an agenda and if you, if you have an agenda it kind of makes you compromise so anyway i just really really want to thank and thank everybody who's given us advice helped us do leg work anything like that because it does it does take you know it takes a village to raise a child it's going to take all of us to save the horses no i want to thank you guys like i said um last week too in my the 20 some years ago I worked for an exhibit company and we actually did the designing of bill uh, booths for trade shows so from the backside I know what that entailed I can't even imagine this undertaking that you guys have and um, I'm excited to meet you guys in person and and Same be here. a part of all this so so um I don't know if anybody else has any questions at all um, I will do my best to get this video on our YouTube channel and I'll share the link. Um, I always say the technology gods are, uh, are, I'm at their mercy. So this is a new thing for me too. So uh, we should have that up within the next couple of days and we'll do that and we'll have some calls to action. And yeah, we'll get together and I'll, I'll uh, set up a call to action for that where people can just start doing blast emails to their representatives. So what time in the morning do the sessions start? 9 a.m. Heather said. Okay. Yeah. And oh, one other thing is we do have a petition running and there, there's several that calls to actions. We are up to almost 80, I think 87,000 signatures. We want to get it to 100,000 and we are going to be, well, we're going to have a representation. We're going to have one printed out, but we are going to have them on either thumb drives or a link for the congressional people saying basically, you know, it's not just us. Here's 100,000 of my friends saying we want the horses saved. So there's a couple of things like that. And I'm getting ready to, we have a GoFundMe and I'm getting ready to do just a random, uh, you know, an auction with some, just some fun stuff and that we'll have some t-shirts and um, some artistic t-shirts and stuff like that for sale um, or auction. But it, all, the, all the funds will go to Saver Wild Horses. And if we do end up with excess money, it will go to a, a wild horse organization um, to be determined once, to, if we have anything left over. And this is actually, a, is get grassroots, funded by everybody help pitching in again we don't have a budget for this <laughs> but it, it it like i said it's it's worthwhile and i we can always say we did everything we could do just like you chris if, if we don't we're not successful we can say i did everything within my means right. to do to try to do what we could do right so heather I just do you want to um 
Sorry, yeah, before we let everybody go, Janet Hickert came up and asked, does anybody uh, try to have an exhibit at local fairs? Um, so Linda Greaves and Linda Kemp have both done booths at local events, vegan markets, far, not vegan markets, vegan fairs, farmers markets, expos um, that are wild horse and trapping, anti-trapping based. Uh, Diane in Colorado did a great uh, booth at the Rocky Mountain Horse Show uh, a couple months ago. And, and then, like I said, just, you know, Pam handing out postcards at the screening of the documentary in New Jersey. So I did start a page on the website, um, saverwildhorses.net. It's under the more tab and it's labeled events, fairs, and expos, I think. I put some pictures up there of the booze that Linda and Linda and Diane did, as well as some photos for, that Pam did uh, at the screening. And yeah, absolutely. You know, if you guys can hit a farmer's market or a vegan market or you know just set up a table outside the library or outside a pet store or if you can attend an expo my hope is at some point i can start you know paying attention to where the big expos are and listing them and seeing if we can get you guys involved in doing a booth there is sometimes a cost for the booth um you know but if you can partner up with one or two or three other advocates in your area and you can all join together we have lots of stuff available on the website um, that you can take with you so I think it was Janet was saying that she has, um, no, Linda Wallace. I have exhibited at our local Saturday market and I currently have wild horse photographs on display at a local winery to help get interest going. And that's great, you know, have some pretty pictures of the wild horses to show them the beauty that's out there on the public lands. And then on the tables have some photos from the roundups. Um, all of those are available on the website on a different page. And then on the brochures and graphics page is the download for our trifold brochure. Or if you just need 25 or 50, you can reach out to Linda or myself. And if we have some extra ones, we'll get those mailed out to you. And then if you just need some tips, um, you know, about what to talk about at your booth and so forth, you can just reach out to either one of us and we can help you. Mike yeah. Jenkins um, went to an event about a month ago and he was handing out papers about wild horses. Um, he said the BLM guy was actually snatching the papers off the desk when Mike wasn't looking. So, um, you know, the, the BLM knew he was there and they were snacking the stuff, hoping he wouldn't be able to hand it out, but he just kept going. And it's, you know, again, very few people know that we actually have wild horses in the West and that they need our help. So it's a really great way to get involved and, and make it so that people do know that it's there and that the horses need help. Yeah, and also on that, the, the stuff we're talking about on the website, most of it is free downloadable. Heather's done a fantastic job of putting that stuff together. Um, there are there are some things that there is a cost involved, and we've actually considered take, making up little packets. And um, I noticed Lorna said, yes, yeah, some of these expos and stuff like that are expensive. I always tell them what I'm doing. I tell them I'm not, I don't have money. It's a budget. And if I could get a discount, and almost always they have given me discounts. Um, if you're a nonprofit, sometimes you can get a nonprofit rate. But like I said, we're not even a nonprofit, but I have asked for discounts. And like I said, I just recently did the World Horse Expo and I went in with another organization on, on that booth and that they helped cover half the cost of that. So yeah, the, yeah, sometimes it's some of them might be too expensive to do. But and also I was gonna say real quick about the conference, you know, the two hundred dollars covers two all three days and that, and it is probably on the lower end of like what a lot of the conferences and stuff are going for. I wish we could do it for free, but again, we just can't. We just can't afford to do that because I'm not rich, and neither is Heather. <laughs> so anyway, but yeah. So if you if you want to go to so reach out to see us from other people, or maybe they'll be willing to sponsor you. Um, and if you put their information out on their your table or something, so that might be a way of helping. Um, offset the costs of the booths. Chris, did you see yeah. the question there about um, uh, the TRNP campaign and Congressperson Inshaw? Yes. Um, yeah, so Armstrong came out early on. So when our senators were saying, um, please, you know, get your comments in and they weren't really taking a stance, he came out early and strong um, supporting the park and saying he trusted them to do the science and the research needed and you know it's hard to manage a park and yada yada so we've been emailing him um, every week I know that from our website alone we've had about 150 emails that have gone out over the last couple of weeks American Wild Horse Campaign put a link on their site to email him um, he's in, and people have asked why he's important 
Um, so when we're going to Washington DC, for example, and Congressman Cohen is an excellent example. His, he is very supportive of helping wild horse advocacy groups and he's more than willing to help us. One of our goals is to get these horses protected under public law because wild horses in the National Park Service are not protected under the Wild Horse and Burrow Act. So they're at the mercy of the National Park Service and each individual park does whatever they want, it's apparently. So if I'm going to go ask Representative Cohen to help our horses here, he's hesitant to help because when this goes to the floor of in the House, then if Congressman Armstrong isn't going to support what's happening in his state, then how can he, right? How can he tell him what to do? So it is really important that we get his support. Um, I do have an appointment with his office when I am in Washington, D.C. He's one of the ones I do have an appointment with. So um, if he's probably never going to support it, one of the big things is the resolution that passed the North Dakota House and Senate unanimously. So that that is a huge thing, especially in our society today, that Democrat, Republican, Independent, everybody voted 100%, please keep the horses in the park. Armstrong is supposed to be the voice of the people of North Dakota. That's the voice of the people in North Dakota. And that's what he's supposed to be doing. This should not be his own personal opinion. This is, he's, we elected him to be our voice. So that needs to be brought to his attention. And I said today, if you sent him an email before, send him an email again, because they're not hearing it. Um, he, he's probably not gonna change his mind. If he's not going to, then this is something that he'll have to answer to hopefully at the polls the next time he goes up for reelection. So I know he was just elected too, I believe. So it's gonna be uh, a while, but um, but everybody's important, right? Um, but especially the people in North Dakota and we do have that support. He's the only one missing. So that is a big, that's a big miss. Yep, so keep talking. Um, and I am gonna have some calls to action around Armstrong for this week too. So just keep watching our website. So we'll have some different things that we can do. And there's also gonna be some new information coming out about Theodore Roosevelt National Park courses, which I think might help also change his mind and also enlighten a lot of people in some different ways too. So, so um, we also have our phone calls to Armstrong. You can send him phone, call, uh, phone calls, send him emails, send him letters. Um, our website is www.chwha.org, and we can put that in the chat too. Thank you, Heather. So, um, yeah, phone calls, letters, emails, postcards, whatever you can do um, just to keep raising the awareness. Letters to the editor, that's going to be probably one of our calls to action this week. Letters to the editor and calling him out in that. And even letters to the editor in your local areas talking about the plight of wild horses everywhere. That's a great way. And that's how our state representatives actually started getting wind of what was happening. They kept seeing every day there was a letter to the editor when the park announced their plans to get rid of the horses. So they knew they had to do something. So I think was at the else? conference, um, Cynthia Smoot is actually going to take a few minutes to talk about the importance of letters to the editor. And we're, uh, we've got somebody, I don't know if she's on the call today. Yep, I can see her down there, I think. Um, we've got somebody writing up some letter to the editor samples uh, that we'll have printed out and on one of the tables. Um, I've got one of those on the website now, I think under actions to take. And then once I get the remaining letter to the editor samples, I'll be adding those too. And, you know, submitting a letter to the editor is so simple, you guys. You just go to your local newspaper's website uh, find the letter to the editor submission tab, put in your information and just, you know, you can copy and paste what we're giving you, or you can change it a little bit to make it your own. Um, but it's so quick and easy. And again, it's so many people will sit down to the paper and just read all the letters to the editor to the day. And what if you're reaching out to two or three people who had no idea we have wild horses? So again, it's just another way to help bring attention to the wild horses and burrows, and it couldn't be a simpler way to do it. Someone said, um, you know, just FYI, the horses are a federal issue based on location, not a state issue. And we know that. And so that's actually why this Friday we'll be having a horse talk. And we're going to talk with our North Dakota House Minority Leader, Representative Boucher, because we do think that there's some confusion. You know, our, our House and Senate passed the resolution. And we think that people think that this is done and taken care of, but it really is only an ask for the state of North Dakota. You know, it's North Dakota saying, hey, please, our federal legislators, Senate, uh, Secretary Howland, um, 
National Park Service Director Sam's, please keep the horses in the park. That's all that we can do at a state level. So I'm hoping that he clears some of that up too and talks about the process and, and what they're doing to help. Would it be possible for the president of the US to enact the Antiquities Act for the preservation protection of America's wild equines based on categories of cultural and natural resources? I don't know if you guys wanna talk about that or if you have any thoughts on that. Um. It's there's a lot of things the president could do, um, but at this point, I don't know that he's that anything that's been going on with the horses has even gotten through to him. We're really fractured um, and fragmented in pieces of people trying to do stuff. Um, last year, we actually did get almost 100,000 signatures, and I personally took them in a petition into Holland and Manning, asking them for 15 minutes of their time at the conference, and they couldn't be bothered. So. I don't know that we that fact they won't give us 15 minutes and they ask, but they'll meet with the ranchers that they're sharing any of this information with Biden. That's why again the postcard campaign. If somebody they keep getting them and they say, somebody's finally starts saying, well, what is this about? Maybe we need to look into it. Um, sometimes you have to go around the obstacles we have in front of us. Um, and someone said, beware of letter counts on letters to the editor. You don't want them to count that down. I don't know if anybody has a like a, a standard on what's a good amount for a word count. I think I think, on? I think papers have around 200, I think 200 to 250 tops usually. Yeah, but they'll they'll let you know. Usually it says, you know, they'll they'll, tell, they'll let you know what the parameters of the letter would be. Letters to Biden always skirts the issue. I wrote the letter and came back and didn't even mention one word about wild horses, just everything else. I think that this is also too, um, somebody asked me recently, like, why do you keep doing this? And, or do you, or I think, do you really think that you're gonna make a difference? I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't think I was gonna make a difference, right? I mean, it'd be a big waste of my time. I'm hoping that it is. So, um, I think that we just have to keep fighting until we do get the change. And I think that raising awareness to other people, like you guys are saying, there are people who don't know that there are still wild horses in the West or what's happening. And when they learn, just like our Theodore Roosevelt horses, they're very upset. So I think that just sharing posts, sharing information and just hoping, right, the squeaky wheel will get noticed. Exactly. So, yeah. And I think that also like some people say, well, why are you doing stuff on the East Coast or in D.C.? Because a lot of the staff for these people that work for them, they're not from the states they live in. They are local. So once they start getting, they start paying attention. But also, if we have 10 states that are anti-wild horse and the rest of them are all, we figure through science, we get them on board, they would have a little bit harder time saying what they say and or having full weight. Of course, they're going to have some clock because they are the ones that have the horses. But when if the rest of the rest of the country was up in arms saying we want the horses protected, we want our public lands protected, um, then they, they would have a different argument instead, instead of saying, well, we got it covered. Don't worry about it, guys. And that's what, what happens. We're saying, no, they don't have it covered. It's wrong. And same thing with like in your state, you know, people ask, well, you know, if the, all the state legislators are supporting the horses, the person going to DC to speak for you. And that is actually, I did that on a different subject one time. And we came up to the point that we will actively, we promise we will actively campaign against you and get be pointing this out when it's time for re-election. So it's gonna affect them. So for some reason, they if they think one way and then they sit there and know that you're not gonna go away, you're not just the little teeny fly, you're gonna be really, really persistent and keep buzzing around that it might make a difference. And the option to not do anything means that the, they're all doomed. And for me, I can't in good conscience walk away. And because I have children, I have a grandchild coming. I would like them to have public lands and nature when they grow up and not be in live, you know. And it's, uh, you know, it's up to us. And people have fought for really hard things in the past and, and nothing comes easy. I can also say too, even at a state level, um, it was kind of like a funny thing when the resolution went to the Senate floor, the committee gave it a due pass. And when they posted it online, they posted it as do not pass. And the Senator that was carrying the bill went into the office and said, are you trying to get me killed? Um, we said pass this. So everything matters, right? I mean, every little thing matters. Another representative told me that this should pass unanimously. He said, if anyone votes against this, it'd be like a death wish, you know I mean? So once people start knowing and the pressure starts getting on, I think that, and that's just at a state level, which is, you know, 
um, still, um, once the pressure's on, I think that the more people we can get putting that pressure on is the key. Someone said to write to Dr. Biden. I think that that's a wonderful idea too. Sometimes um, that might be a way into to Biden too, so. Okay. Okay, I, I can I can address this. Um, right now, what we're focusing on is turning turning off the faucet. I mean, there we got big puddles. We need to clean up of horses that are going into bad situations with the AIP program and stuff like that. We're not focusing as much on that. I, I, ideally, if I think they're going to have an AIP program, there should be some kind of safety net, but there's not. If, um, but if we stop getting the horses rounded up to the number they are, they wouldn't be having to push them out with no, no uh, safety net. I have a friend about 20 years ago, she was actually a home check person for BLM on Mustangs that were adopted out. She would go before they were adopted to get approved and then she would check on them at six months and again at nine months. And if the horses were not in good care, they did, did remove them and they decided to unfund that. So um, if we're gonna do anything, it needs to be, I think for me, I'm working from the top down. I know there's people that are bailing horses out on the bottom, but again, we need to make sure that even the people that are bailing them are bailing them into good situations and not just another round of abuse. Because you talk to some of these trainers, these horses have been shuffled from one person to another to a kill pen, they get adopted out, they go somewhere else, sit in quarantine, and then the people don't ever come and get them and they go back in the kill pen. We have to, we have to stop them going into that state. These horses are supposed to be federally protected, but that aside, no horse should be going to in the kill pin or the slaughter stuff, but I also will not give a kill pin buyer a dollar. I will not bail a horse. I go if For me, I will go to a sanctuary or I will help people bailing them out of auctions, but the, once the kill buyer, buyer has them and starts dangling them, they're making money and they're, they're taking that money and buying other horses to direct ship to slaughter. So it's, it's a horrible, horrible situation, but and we all have to figure, you know, we have, we have to go broad. We have to do different things. But for me, I'm trying to turn the faucet off so there's not any more horses that need to be bailed. I just want to say, I agree. I mean, that's, it's not that we don't care about the horses and the auction pens and so forth. I mean, Mike Jenkins is doing a fantastic, some fantastic work on tracking wild horses that are being funneled through the AIP program and are then ending up in kill pens. And um, uh, somebody on the call today, and I, I think she's left, no, it was Peggy, I think, wrote me a, a one-page sheet on the AIP program that we can include in the congressional packet, because that's just a waste of taxpayer dollars as well, right? But ultimately, yeah. there's only so many rescues and sanctuaries in this country, and so many of them are full. And not to mention what has happened with the cost of hay and feed. It has gotten absolutely ridiculous. I had horses... I don't know, 15 years ago, and I think a bale of hay in Southern Oregon cost me $3.50. It's a whole lot more inexpensive than that today. And rescues and sanctuaries are going broke, trying to save as many of these horses as we can. So we absolutely care about them. Um, but like Linda said, our focus is if we don't get the roundup stopped and we don't get the BLM to start doing proper range management to keep the horses and burrows out there, those auction pens are gonna forever be full and there will be nobody to take them. So our goal is to get that stopped so that the trickle effect will stop and hopefully eventually there's just no wild horses ending up in the auction and kill pens. I think that it also speaks to what you guys were saying too, that it's working from every angle. So where your strength is, that's where we all need to come together. Yeah, exactly. Does anybody else have any questions? I think we got to everything. I know if you have any questions after this or anything comes to you, um, can you list all the current bills for the wild horses? Do you guys have that on your website? There aren't there, any. There aren't any. <laughs> other than veterans for Mustang, um, there's no yeah, other wild horse legislation active right now. And there's no other, and please read the Veterans for Mustangs Act um, before you support it or don't support it either way. It's always important to read the, the bill that's been introduced and it's usually pretty short wording, um, but there's no other wild horse legislation out there right now. And there's no legislation on the SAFE Act. Okay, so and our I'll, focus right now is the budget. 
Yeah. And I was going to say right now, I've talked to some of the, um, uh, some of the people that do, have done and supported and tried to get bills in before. And a lot of them are saying they're concerned with the people in charge with Zinke and stuff like that back in charge. They're afraid of opening up the Wild Horse and Barrow Act that it might be gutted or damaged more than whatever the bill could possibly improve. Um, if, if something comes forward, we're definitely open to doing it. And we're not really addressing the Veterans for Mustang program because at the conference, we don't address um, birth control, um, PZP, Gonacon. You know, we all have our personal opinions about this stuff. I think everybody's across the board is anti gonicon but it's just, it's a subject that's just too polarizing. So we've decided to focus on getting people uh, up to speed so they can be stronger advocates without having that subject that, you know, we could debate for days. Um, so that's, that's, you know, one other th aspect of it, but yeah, like, like I said, right now, there's really nothing. And same thing with the SAFE Act. I'm hoping that we'll get something and we've made arrangements if the SAFE Act has been introduced that we will, we will, you know, at least uh, share that information. But we also really quick, when you're legis you know, when you're talking to somebody about public lands, they have nothing to do with the SAFE Act. And if you call and talk to animal people, they have nothing to do with wild horses. Mixing them together dilutes both. And they, that, you know, what you're talking about will probably go nowhere. Make fo two phone calls, call and talk about the wild horses, hang up, pick it back up and call and ask them to support the SAFE Act. Make sure you keep those two things separate because they're two different committees because the, the legislators will have people dealing with public lands and that would be wild horses and natural resources. And then you have people that are dealing with animal issues and stuff like that. And or like some and sometimes health issues when they're talking about the toxicity of horse meat. So they're different people that handle different things and you want to put the right things in the right hands. And just quickly, too, and I see you have a question there, Chris, um, that I'll let you get to here in a second. But when you do call your representative to talk to them about legislation, always include the bill number because there's always multiple SAFE acts, F-S-A-F-E, -E, yeah. and it always stands for different things. So if a SAFE act is reintroduced that has to do with stopping the slaughter of equines, always grab the bill number and have that with you when you call in. Yes. I wanted to say too, um, I don't wanna get in, I know the Veterans for Mustangs is, a, is controversial for a lot of different reasons. And so that's not something I wanna talk about, but I have talked to people from there and, one thing I think that's important that maybe is being overlooked is that they have, they've gotten some attention and they've got the attention of the right people. And I do know that part of their, their hope is to bring other issues to the table with that. Yeah. Like this was just kind of a way in the door. And yeah. I think that no matter where you are on that, I think that that's important to remember that it's just another avenue in hopefully to get some change. So, um, what is the argument for the wild horses that are so damaging to the TRMP? They're not native, neither are all the people in the United States, correct. Um, so the park has, the park has always called the horses like a historical demonstration herd or wildlife. Um, and all of a sudden they decided that now they're livestock. And then they came out and said that livestock are not allowed in National Park Service lands, it goes against their policy. So we asked, um, what about Assateague Island National Seashore? They have wild horses. And they said, well, we can't speak to their management. So I asked them, right? How are you allowed to have wild horses, but we can't have them here in this national park? And they said, well, we don't call them livestock. We see them as a cultural resource. So as quickly as they change the name to livestock, they can take that away and call them a cultural resource if they wanted to. It's a very vague argument. But if you look at the history of these horses, they have been trying to get rid of these horses from the minute they realized they were fenced in. And local, um, local pressure always wins. Public outcry always wins. So we're, but this is, people I've talked to, this is their biggest attempt to really eliminate the horses and it's, they're really coming in hard with it. So, and you have to think too, if the governor said, hey, we'll give you every resource in the state of North Dakota, money, science, people, research, whatever you need, and they haven't grabbed that and they're continuing on, that says something at this moment. So. We're not putting our guard down until we hear that they have a management plan that takes science and genetics into consideration. And until they're protected under public law, like the Shackleford Banks wild horses are. So, um, and this is a problem that when we talked to Castle last weekend, Dr. McLaughlin, she said the National Park Service went to court twice to be excluded from the, from the Wild Horse and Burrow Act. So management of these horses is on the individual park and up to the superintendent. So 
it, it, and things change from point to point, but they have been actively trying to get rid of these horses just from the history of the park. So, and as far as far as being native, they say that they're an invasive species, they're not native, they were fenced into the park. They had to bring bison in, they had to bring elk in, the elk and bison are native, the horses are not. So, I mean, it's just, it's the, the science that they ask us to show for the comment period is a joke compared to what they're giving us to make their, their argument, right? So, right, livestock, when they argue, they, they do round up horses there. They use low stress methods where they're tranquilizing the horses. But then again, we have problems with their, no one's vetting these buyers either. They're sold on a uh, government surplus website where you can buy a copy machine and you can buy a horse and nobody vets them. Nobody vets the buyers. Nobody checks to see, checks up on them to see how they are. And then we see after a little while, you know, you get a four month old horse that's adorable. And then a couple of years later, this horse needs a new forever home and needs a new forever home and needs a new forever home. And it just never ends. So there's, there's a lot that's been going wrong here. Um, and we're hoping to change some of that, so. Does Chasing Horses Wild Horse Advocates get input into their management at the park? Uh, no, we they aren't listening to anybody at the moment. So um, they quit talking to the public. So for example, I can call Assateague Island. I have talked to their chief resource manager who is very transparent and he'll have a conversation with you about their horses, their management, what they need. If you wanna to talk to anybody here, they created a wild horse portal where you submit your question online and they will take your question there. Things that we've heard since we've been here, we moved here in 2016, is um, the park knows what they're doing and we don't question the park. That's the narrative that's been going forever. And I think right now we see the park knows what they're doing, right? They're, they're trying to eliminate the horses and selling off all the babies and leaving an older herd has, has brought us to the situation we're in now. So. so no, they're not taking input from anybody at the moment, so. Does anybody else have any questions? You can always email us or you can email Linda and Heather too. I'm sure they'll be happy to answer your questions. So I wanna thank you guys for being here and um, I'm excited to see you guys in a couple of weeks. I look forward yeah, to meeting you too. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And thank you everyone for being here. And don't forget Friday, we'll be talking to our house minority leader, Josh Boucher. So um, that'll be an interesting talk from a legislative perspective. So. Thank you again. You guys have a good day. Thanks.